cool, cool. Thomas, you are here. I will give you. I will have given you a potted bio just before this. Uh, before we get started, how are you today, man? I'm doing good. Doing good. Been been up for a while working on mixes. So now it's second round of coffee. Getting into the social space for the first time in feels like ages. So I'm good. I'm I'm happy to have a conversation. You do your own mixes? Yeah, always. Excellent. Okay, that's great. Um, we're going to come back to that. I just want to make sure I get to one thing first. Um, I, I asked you to be on this podcast because I, I had seen a post regarding uh, social media that had come that I, I thought was useful. But then I managed to get to your social media and I saw that you had written this and I thought it was interesting. Um, I'm going to read it off to you. It says, quote, one of the things I've learned along my path as a musician and teacher is that it is actually rare that an inability to reach any musical goal is caused by physical challenges. Sure, there are people with unique physical dispositions, but the overwhelming majority of people, including yours truly, struggle not because they cannot overcome physical limitations, but for emotional reasons. I think you know how the rest of the post goes on. Um, yeah. It definitely uh, is something that I sense as a music teacher and as a musician as well. And I think that sometimes as musicians who are constantly, you, you know, have this approach to music where we notice ourselves constantly getting better, I do, though I agree with you, um, I do wonder if it's all a perception bias thing. You go on a little bit here and you say, um, what I consider emotional blocks include unhealed trauma, limiting beliefs, clashes between one's personal identity and re the reality of their goals inability to make sufficient time and the space for what it requires for these goals and many more. Um, let me hear you expand on that a little bit. Tell me about your experience as a coach. Why do you think this is the case? Well, for me, um, basically the, the pretext is that I think that we are all in the business of dealing with emotion and we, we are the facilitators of emotion of Tra transmission of emotion from one person to the next it's what we do as artists i believe right so we can we can get lost in the minutia of technicality and of music production and of practicing and whatever it is that we're working on at the time but i think basically at the heart of it what we do is we are trying to translate emotional states and experiences that we have and life experiences into musical statements and then those statements get to translate the intent and our emotions um what we've been writing about and thinking about at that time to the audience so it's like a constant back and forth of emotion and i think we oftentimes forget that fact and we get lost in <laughs> the technicality of what it is that we're doing and um I think as facilitators of emotions and as usually sensitive people that we are going into, into the arts and music, um, a lot of the things that we do struggle with are not in the, like I said in the post, are not in the technicality of the things that we're doing, but in, in the reasons that we are doing them in the first place and why we play music, what are our motivations, what are our struggles, what are our you know, life's paths and purposes. And those things are very emotionally charged for us. And those are usually the things that then define the actual day-to-day -day activities that we do in order to gain you know, success in, in, in fields and to advance towards our goals. So that's where it gets complicated because the, the thing that we're doing, the skill that we're applying, the quality of our work is like very closely connected. I think to our emotional states and to these underlying themes that drive our actions, if that makes sense. I agree. And I think one of the things you point out there that's important is it's almost as if we have uh, musicians and artists, they derive self worth sometimes from different things. Mm -hmm. um, I, for me personally, doing the best work that I can do is extremely important to me. And it's the thing that gives me the sense of pride at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. But we're all way too aware of this environment that's going on where people are really asserting or deasserting themselves, frankly, and devaluing themselves based on how successful they are. 
which is like oh. very toxic for the process itself. Um, and, and, right. And it, because the way you just put it, it's, it's a sort of, I, it's a sort of identity verification for people. It's, it's a sort of, uh, self-actualization mm -hmm. for people that they're constantly going through. That's true. It's, but let me, let me jump into that. Um, the, your identity is also on a very deep level connected to um, the quality of work that you can do and the amount of focus that you'll have and you know how how far you can go in achieving a certain goal how much energy you can put into that and I see that all the time in my coaching clients and my my guitar students that it's not and this is going back to the post that you read um, from my social media it's it's oftentimes um, they struggle with a certain thing and they they see that certain thing before them and they try everything as they perceive it. You know, they, they practice, they work, they, they do the thing. But then what oftentimes they are, um, the identity that they would have to assume that they, the person that they would have to become in order to reach that goal is out of their reach and they don't know why because they couldn't imagine it from their current vantage point if that makes sense right because in order in order to become uh, in order to gain a certain thing in your life and a certain skill you have to become that person that makes that happen that works with that right and you uh that's that's a really clever way of putting it i i, I would just kind of say that for you to self-actualize the person you become would be kind of unrecognizable to the person that you are <laughs> yeah currently right? right right and so it's a it's a constant evolution of our identity and I, I think identity shifts are at the heart of reaching your goals but identity shifts are a very emotionally charged topic because you can't just snap a finger and become a different person you have to make the make the experiences you have to uh gain the insight you have to work on certain things that will then come back to you in an update of your personality. And so a lot of times we go through the motions over and over again. And again, this is something that I see in students and people that come to me for help. <clears throat> it's not in the strategies that they use to, you know, to conquer these objects, whether it's in a guitar technique or like a creative block in their songwriting or something they struggle with it's it's a it's a deeper layer that's like like the technique is on the surface that they're trying to work on but below that surface is literally their identity and they have to or we have to find together a way to shift that identity into the direction of what it is that they're trying to achieve and that goes for, for myself as well of course have you ever seen the movie the karate kid <laughs> the original from from the 80s yes yeah, yeah I, I did. So there's this, uh, I mean, it's, I mean, I'm sure you know the part I'm talking about, but you know, the, you know, Daniel wants to learn how to do the really technical karate, you know, the stuff that he, that is going to save him from the bully. And the first thing that Mr. Miyagi wants to see is, is if he can wash the car, the wax on wax off thing. Yeah, right? I remember that. Yeah, it's yeah. kind of this test of it, it. It's, it's sort of a trope about the mental acuity required to focus. It's mm -hmm. a small metaphorical lens into what it takes to be a great warrior. And, uh, I think that that thing holds very, very true kind of for what you just said, because you're gradually breaking through this onion where you're focusing more and more and you're getting more identified with your target. But at the same time, like when you're sitting down and you're practicing something like guitar, there is a certain straightforwardness to it, right? I mean, there really is a sense by which that if you put the 10,000 hours in um, playing with a metronome, you know, you will become a technically adept guitar player. I think that's kind of what your quote speaks to, by the way, because mm -hmm. what you're sort of asserting is that I, I wrote something very similar. What, what I basically said is that the, the obstacle that most people face is the 10,000 hours not yeah. the the true technical ability and i think maybe the difference that emerges between like real real giftedness and not you know just someone who's a great player is songwriting right like maybe that right. is the fundamental difference um yeah so first of all um because before it gets too complicated um that was a beautiful analogy i love the karate kid thing because it really is exactly what we're talking about right in that in that scene he gets 
he gets to try on like a new suit in, in a way of personality. So are you going to be that person who is 100% invested into this goal? Can you, can, and that's like the, the most important thing to me, can you make the necessary sacrifices? And that's what identity is. Like, are you willing to sacrifice some things for the benefit of those things? Um, are you willing to, to go there? Are you willing to restructure your life and your preferences and your, your focus to, towards that thing? So, um, yeah, when we're talking about the, the 10,000 hours, I think it really is about, are you going to be the person that goes the necessary path that travels the necessary distance and it's very easy to you know to say but really hard to do for most people and that's not in that's that's never really in their in their uh, skill set or their physical ability or whatever it is it really is about are you going to be that person who sits there for ten thousand hours does the thing seeks out the necessary information and it sounds simple, but it really isn't because the filtering out information um, and sitting down for practice over a long, long period of time that will confront you with a lot of inner demons and a lot of obstacles that you face in your identity, right? Because it, there's sacrifice involved and there's um, emotional states will come up, which are going to be putting you off that path for, you know, for many different reasons, depending on your your experience uh, and your upbringing, there's going to be a lot of things that will detract you from that path, even though you know what the necessary steps are. Like Taking those steps is the hard part. Yeah, I, I love one of the things you just said, man. You, I, I think you identified the, the core there, which is that sacrifice is fundamental to identity. I mean, try Understand. saying that. It, it's funny. Try saying that secularly, though, without it having kind of an admonition of God fearing this, because I, I think that that's actually oh. important, right? Because I, I don't want to bring that in maybe just yet, but um, just this idea that there is this space, this void that is all of the things that you aren't willing to give up, the mm -hmm. things you're not willing to give up are in this like space and those are the things that are directly between you and whatever the goal is they're also the things by the way that separate you from the person who's going to get what it is you want um and i think that like you could speak i want you to speak to this in a second because we've all been through unique struggles here but tell me uh about any of the sacrifices that you've made uh to get where you are as a player you're a great guitar player um, oh, you've obviously made sacrifices. I'm just curious. Do you have things that you can identify and point to that were a big deal to you? Well, more than I can I can count. Um, I think for for me personally, it's it's that thing that we've been discussing up until now, over and over and over again. Um, and maybe maybe that's the reason why I went into coaching other people on these subjects in the first place because I feel uh like i so i'm kind of evading the question a little bit but i would say <laughs> and thank you for the compliment but i i've never um considered myself a great player or a great x a great z a great y in, in any in any stretch of the imagination i think i <clears throat> come from a place without talent and without privilege in, in a way that i i didn't get a deep music education or um didn't start particularly early or wasn't born in a super musical family so in order to do the things that i have done uh so far i always like time and time again i went against this barrier of who i was and where my place in life was and then had to figure out one way or the other how to become that person and to change myself into a person that can achieve those things uh, that hopefully now you get to hear on record and see live and um, hear in the songwriting. So it's it's been that struggle over and over again. It's been so many things that I had to work on and still have to work on. I think my the biggest one yet to for me that's like an ongoing thing is fear of success. I'm terrified of 
what it means to reach my goals, actually. Yeah, I, I can actually empathize with that a lot. Um, some of my listeners will be familiar, but uh, in 2022, uh, I had an exchange with a German record CEO who's the founder of Nuclear Blast, actually. And he gave me a record deal for an album that I made. Yeah. And this was like a very eye-opening moment for me. I had the moment of, whoa, and came back to Earth, realized not so long after that he sold the company after my record came out, like just after my record came out. And this became a quagmire. I was very, very lucky. If people have followed, they know that I left that record deal um, and was able to get out scot-free. But we all have, it's funny, I think one of the reasons why success is maybe instinctively scary for people and why it became scary for me is because it was fundamentally Sisy Sisyphusian. It was, uh, I don't know if you know Sisyphus, uh, but yeah. Sisyphus is, yeah, so for people watching, Sisyphus is the guy who has to keep carrying the boulder up the mountain just for, he thinks he's getting to the top, but he's never getting to the top. Um, when you real, I mean, it's kind of comforting though, because then you remember, okay, I'm actually doing all of these things literally just so I can make the best art that I can, which should have always been the reminder and success becomes this like really like kind of like nagging distraction, almost like the evil fairy, like sitting on your shoulder. Um, right. but, uh, okay, let's, let, let's shift gears a little bit. Let's talk. So I want to, I wanted to, of course, talk about the obscure thing I've, wanted you to you know it seems like when you make posts about this it gets squashed by the algorithm i don't know if you've had any real chance to talk about this situation with the press i would like you to just tell <laughs> what your side of the story is here um because after listening to your music and after like getting you know because there are stories of people all over the internet claiming that they had some place on a record and that they were never recognized and usually you can't identify from their music that they're actual songwriters and what part yeah. of the process they've been this is not the case with you your music is very dynamic it's different it is you are obviously a composer you for people listening um thomas has a band camp um that you will be able to find in the show notes um it combines everything from classical music to rock music to instrumental guitar to indian classical music you can see why we're probably getting along um do you want to just talk a little bit about this situation? Please tell it from your perspective, because I, I don't know if you remember the first time we ever made contact was after mm -hmm. I heard that solo on Acroasis. Yeah. Uh, I thought that that was an excellent guitar solo, and I asked you about it. Well, you're really opening up a whole can of worms, it's like an array of cans. Um, yeah, so the, the story is a bit complicated, but I'll try to break it down in one sentence, and that sentence would be, um, I was in a band called Obscura, and I got, I did an album of them called Akrasis, which I co-wrote and performed on, and uh, I got royally fucked over to the point that it was, there was an attempt by uh, the main man of the band, uh, the lead singer who has also the rights to the name, to basically remove me from the story of the album and um, tried to, he tried to take credit for most of my work, which I then fought against, which ended, ah, it's a very emotional topic for me. So yeah, it ended and um, resulted in a whole online drama and things getting, getting taken out of context, people taking sides and um, my career suffering to this day majorly from that from my time in the band as well as from the fallout of that well i want you to know that it's pretty obvious to anyone who knows anything about music who watched that situation and who watched him kind of need to fill the void with another virtuoso guitar player that was very yeah. obvious kind of but it was it was pretty obvious what had happened there um you know i'm, I'm glad that you outlined it that way um, can you just, just state for the record so we know, so these guitar solos, especially the one I'm talking to, those are your guitar solos? Oh, yeah. 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 I mean, um, I think there's two guitar solos on the entire album that I didn't perform. Okay. And if, you, if you hear the programmed, hyper-edited guitar solos that I'm talking about, which sound more like something Rings of Saturn would do, 
um, and then compare them to the rest of the album, it's pretty obvious that those are two different people. And um, so, yeah, I played all the, the lead guitar work on the album, except for those two solos. And um, I mean, I co-wrote most of the album. Um, there's stuff that I composed almost exclusively, which, um, for example, the song Weltseele, which is the 15 minute closing track. So that's that's only me in terms of composition. But in, I mean, I did incorporate some ideas from from other members of the band at that time, but the composition is mine and uh, all the guitar work is mine. So there's only me on that track when it comes to guitars. And then there's other songs where it's kind of 50 50 um, where um, the the other guitar player on, and singer would perform most of the rhythm guitars i would perform all the lead guitars and so on what have you learned from this experience oh, oh man so see i'm really getting it's like an, a balloon that you pop and like i'm getting every time i try to talk about this topic because it just like what people don't see right they see the album and then see that that drama um and then that's that's like a closed chapter. Okay, that happened, and then everybody moves on. But <clears throat> if you're in it, if you if that is your experience, it's never over, right? Especially with that situation. So it's not like that happened back then, and now I should just shut up about it because that person is harassing me and bad mouthing me and stealing my credits from that album to this day. Right, so it's an ongoing process, and also the, uh, the the therapy I had to go in after that was took years until I could come to grips with that experience. Um, I can tell you, and this is probably a bit controversial, but what it did teach me was um, a lot of things about myself, but also about things like uh, clinical narcissism and sociopathy things that are concepts that i were not on my radar at that time at all um and i had no reference point to deal with the with these topics and how you react if that comes into and if a person like that comes into your life um and i was i was clueless so i would say most of the decisions that i made in response to that to those topics in that band situation we're probably not clever <laughs> well right. I, I know of one that you did make that was yeah. clever which is you released a lot of really great music of your own um and you've yeah. been working on building your own profile via that music so it sounds like i mean to me in my mind man being you know i compose all the music for my band and i've yeah. been performing most of it now too i mean that that might be a little golden lesson right there. I mean, I was on your band camp. You had, I don't know, was it five or six full lengths? Mm -hmm. four, yeah, yeah. Four I mean, full lengths. Um, I've done to this, I mean, at this point, I've participated on something like a hundred albums by different people. Right. And you, you play piano, you play guitar, fretless guitar. Um, you, you really took things. You took a lot of responsibility, it sounds like, although you did, de I mean, I looked at the credits, you delegated a lot of responsibility outward, um, you which is about also your cool to hear your songs. So, sorry, Say, didn't mean No, no, go I'm ahead. So, what you said. Right. I think we have a little bit of time lag here yeah. in, the, in the chat. Um, are you talking about my my own work, my own solo albums? Or yes, yes, about yes. Your Reverse engineering. Yeah, uh, no. because let me let me just say one more thing uh, about the obscure situation because okay yeah sure another, an, another thing that's problematic about that is that if something like that happens like this kind of drama and there is kind of um you know battle between different parties then a lot of the a lot of the the things that di did go right and uh the input of other people and their work gets kind of squashed in the discussion which is very unfortunate and that i feel that whenever it comes to me and uh, my part in obscura and that across this album you know then it really quickly happens that it's me against that person um but there were four people five if you count victor the producer and mixing engineer so there's also a lot of things that went correctly and a lot of awesome input and a lot of 
amazing things that people have contributed. So I also want to say that as much as there's problematic stuff of that and things that I wish would have been different and that I fight against, there's also stuff that went really awesome, great, with awesome people. Of course, yeah. I mean, I, I I wouldn't have suspected you would have had anything else to say. I'm sure it was, you know, when you completed that album, that was a very satisfying feeling. And, you know, the songs on that album are unique. They're very distinct. Um, and so is the mixing. And I'm sure it was a, 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 every album like that is a huge learning experience. It's just, yeah, it's just a way of avoiding it, you know? Yeah, for, for me, that was a giant learning experience. Um, yes. Um, so I wanted to actually so open up the floor here to you. Um, you're talking to a new audience now. Um, a large cross section of my audience would enjoy your music. Um, so just for the, the final bit here, do you have anything to say about future works? Anything that people should be aware of? Anything you want to tell Music World, Music Land? Um, well, I'm I'm currently working, still working on like my biggest project to date, my biggest solo project. So. It's been occupying the last three and a half years of my life, on and off. So, um, new album coming out. It's called Changeling, and um, it's a full band album with like an amazing band that I got to uh, employ for this album. Seventy minutes of music, like bigger, better, more extensive than anything I've done as a leader so far. And self-recorded, self-produced. Oh. Um, well, it is self-recorded, self-produced, although I will say that it's also the most, like it, it had the biggest budget and the longest and extensive production time of anything I've ever done, including high, higher profile projects like Obscura. So it's actually like higher up the ladder in terms of like professional, pro, pro, uh, professional input and also the amount of people working on it so it's really quite amazing to see that now come to to the finish line and to hopefully put it out this year because it's just an enormous piece of work whether people like it is on a different subject of course but as far as i'm concerned like this is the closest i've ever gotten so far to what i want to accomplish on on all levels like artistically lyrically um conceptually uh, in terms of audio quality recording quality all of those things are at the highest level of what i can accomplish at this point and so i'm really happy for that when will that be out i'm not sure yet because i'm trying to negotiate a, a new label deal for that and that not uh, i self-released stuff in the past which has worked great for me um but it's like it's like back in the day i was so put off by the obscura um, experience that I also didn't want to go through a label and people meddling with it. So I self-released a whole bunch of stuff. Also was head of a label, um, a small label for a time and had experiences there. So now I'm like come full circle and I'm like, okay, I, I did that. I know what I can achieve with that. I know where my limitations are. And so now I want to give it uh, into capable hands again that are not my own. All right. Well, you heard it here first. Thank you so much for coming on today, Tom. It was great to finally meet you and oh, uh, hear you. your story. To everyone, you can find Tom's stuff in the links below if you're on YouTube or um, on Spotify. I will list them in the show notes and in anywhere else you get your podcasts. Tom, thank you so much, and we will talk to you soon. Awesome. That was very brief. <laughs> <laughs>